Today we're going to cover Unit 6, which is going to be on circulation and respiration. So the circulatory system is going to be the chief route of distribution in animals. Things it's going to distribute is going to be things such as oxygen. It's also going to distribute nutrients, and it's going to take away the carbon dioxide and the waste products from the tissues and get rid of those. So the function of the circulatory system is that it's going to help transport, it helps with temperature regulation, and it's going to help with protection. So among the vertebrates, those are going to be the animals that have the backbone and spinal column and are going to have a skeletal system. The circulatory system is going to be very, very important. Now going along with the transportation, it's going to be there to help, like we said, transport the oxygen, the nutrients, and waste products. It also helps with the immune cells. So we're going to see the white blood cells and platelets be transported, and it also will be responsible for transporting hormones throughout the body. With temperature regulation, the circulatory system is going to help maintain that body's temperature within optimum range for metabolic functioning. So your body has a set temperature that it likes to function at. 98.6 is what we like to think of as the average set temperature for a body. However, some people work better with it a little bit higher, and some people work better with theirs a little bit lower. In order to keep this temperature at this specific um, range, what your body's going to do is if you get cold, you'll tend to shiver. The movement of those muscles back and forth will help heat the body up, and therefore the body will then, or the blood will then carry that heated blood throughout the body to help warm up other appendages and areas. Now also with that, your blood vessels are going to be able to dilate, which means they're going to open up, and that's going to allow the blood to rush through. It usually does this when you're nice and warm. And if you're cold, they tend to constrict and then they kind of dive deep or try to get deeper within the muscle tissue. And when it does this, it's going to help try to keep that blood warm. Now protection, the circulatory system is actually going to contain a variety of cells and chemicals that are going to contribute to the individual's defense against infection and pathogens. And so these are going to be your different types of white blood cells and your lymphatic and immune system. So types of circulatory systems that we'll find in multicellular organisms are going to be those such as a no formal circulatory system. That's going to be for thin organisms that each cell is going to actually have direct contact with its outside. This is going to be things such as flatworms, so it just uses simple diffusion to bring in substances and to get rid of substances. And then you're going to have what's called an open circulation or open circulatory system and a closed circulation or closed circulatory system. Now with the no formal, this is going to be like we said with the thin animals where it can just diffuse directly across. They don't need a circulatory system. It does not have to go long distances. And so you're going to see this with some animals like jellyfish and some of the other nadarians that aren't going to actually have a structured circulatory system like you tend to think. And so looking here, you see the circulatory system of this jellyfish. It's actually going to suck water in. It's going to go to the different areas. It's going to be in that gastrovascular cavity. And then it will push it out through the same way that it brought it in, through the mouth. Now when it does this, this oxygen and nutrients is going to diffuse directly into the cells and tissues. And waste products are going to diffuse out of them. And that's what's going to exit through the mouth. Next, we have the open circulatory system. This is where these animals are going to have fluid that's going to move inside and outside of the containing vessels that it has. So there's going to be no real clear distinction between the circul circulating fluid and then the interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid is going to be fluid that's simply found between the cells. The heart is going to pump the fluid mixture and is going to be actually referred to as hemolymph instead of blood in these um, types of animals. So it's going to pump it throughout the extracellular spaces inside of that body. And so you're going to see this in things such as insects and most mollusks. And lastly, we're going to have the closed circulatory system. These are always going to contain their circulating fluids within specific vessels. And so these are going to be for things 
all the vertebrates. So this would include us. And so with these, the blood's going to be contained within vessels that separate it from the interstitial fluid. You're going to have a muscular heart pump that's going to propel the blood through vessels and tissues throughout the body. And so with this, that heart is going to be a big muscle that's actually going to generate a lot of force. Inside the heart, you're going to have receiving chambers. The receiving chamber is going to be referred to as the atrium. And you're going to have a pumping chamber. The pumping chamber is going to be the ventricle. Along with the heart, you're going to have specific, specific vessels. And so these vessels are going to transport blood throughout the body. You can have veins, which are going to carry blood to the heart. And arteries are going to carry blood away from the heart. Capillaries are going to be the exchange point at the tissues. And so looking at these, you see the arteries carrying the blood away from the heart to the capillaries. The capillaries are going to allow that oxygen and the nutrients to diffuse across into the tissues. And then from there, inside those cells, they will have a buildup of waste products and carbon dioxide. That's going to diffuse the other way and it's going to go into the veins. Now, arteries that are at the capillaries are going to be very, very small. Those are going to be the smallest arteries that you will have, and they're actually referred to as arterioles. Then, where the blood's going to diffuse into the veins, those are going to be the smallest veins that you have, and those are actually referred to as venules. Right, so looking here, each capillary is going to have a diameter so narrow that blood cells must pass through them in a single file line. So they kind of line up like a stack of coins, and it's called a rouleau. And so with this structure also, um, they're going to have a smooth muscle that's going to be at the beginning of it. Let's see if it shows. It doesn't show it on that picture. So there's going to be a smooth muscle that you can find at the beginning of these sections here. And that smooth muscle can actually clamp down on that area and it can keep blood from moving through the capillaries there. And it can open up if it wants to start allowing that blood to move back through there. Now with the veins and venules, those are gonna have actual valves in them because they're not gonna be under high pressure. Arteries are under high pressure because they're coming off the heart. Veins are not under high pressure, so they'll need um, valves in there to keep the blood from flowing backwards. All right. So looking at the closed circulatory system here of a fish, they're going to have a two-chambered heart with a single circuit flow. And so here you see that the oxygen is going to come in through the gills. As it gets pumped through the body, it's going to go deliver it to the body tissues. It's going to pick up carbon dioxide that then gets pumped to the heart. The atrium's the receiving chamber, sends it to the ventricle, and then that pressure comes off of the ventricle and then goes back to the gills. The next type of closed system is going to be the three-chambered heart. Now we're going to find the three-chambered heart in most reptiles and amphibians. And so with these, the heart's going to have a two-circuit of flow here. And so you're going to breathe, or the amphibian or reptile's going to breathe in through the lungs, the oxygenated blood will then come in to the left atrium. From the left atrium, it gets pumped out of the left ventricle. It makes its way to the body tissues where it's going to distribute the oxygen. Then it's going to pick up the carbon dioxide. It's going to pump it back to the heart where it's going to go in through the right atrium to the right ventricle. It's then going to be pumped out and hit its way back to the lungs where it will be exhaled. Now, with this type of circulatory system, you'll have it called the pulmonary and the systemic circulatory system. The pulmonary circuit is going to be where the blood's going to be pumped to the lungs, where it picks up oxygen. The systemic circulatory system is going to be where the blood is then going to be pumped to the tissues of the body, where it's going to deliver oxygen. Now here we're going into the next type of closed system. This is going to be the four chamber heart. You're going to find this in mammals and birds. So they're going to have two circuits of flow. With these two circuits of flow, you're going to have what's called the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. Lots of times I like to talk about the pulmonary circuit first. So we're going to start. 
we're going to start here actually with the body or the capillaries picking up the deoxygenated blood and it's going to carry that deoxygenated blood to the right atrium. From the right atrium, it's going to go through this valve here into the right ventricle. The right ventricle is going to be the pumping chamber. Remember, the atrium is the receiving, the ventricle is the pumping. So it's going to pump it from the right ventricle out. It's going to come out the pulmonary trunk, go through the pulmonary um, arteries, and it's going to go to the lungs. From there, it's going to exchange the carbon dioxide. It's going to pick up oxygen and then it's going to make its way back to the heart. So that oxygenated blood is now going to come in to the left atrium. It's going to come in through what's known as pulmonary veins. Remember veins go to the heart, arteries go away. So it comes in through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. It's going to go through what's known as the mitral or bicuspid valve into the left ventricle. From that left ventricle it's going to go out the aortic valve and then it's going to go through the aorta and the arteries and it's going to get pumped to the tissues of the body. There it's going to deliver its oxygen and pick up carbon dioxide and do it all over again. So when it goes from the heart to the lungs back to the heart, that's what we're calling the pulmonary circuit. And when it's going from the heart to the body systems back to the heart, that's what we refer to as the systemic circuit. So the heart is going to be at the center of the human circulatory system. Looking here, you can see what is supposed to be a picture of those red blood cells stacking up in a line in order to make their way through a capillary. Now inside the human circulatory system, it's going to be composed of that main muscle. It's going to be about the size of a male fist, and it's going to be found in the center of your chest. That's going to be referred to as mediastinum, where it's located. So it's going to be responsible for pumping blood and nutrients around the body and picking up the waste products and pumping those so they could be released through either the urinary system or through the lungs. So looking at this human heart, you see coming in to the heart first is going First is going to be what we know as the superior vena cava here. That's going to be where deoxygenated blood from the head and the upper portion of the body, so the limbs, is going to come into that right atrium. Below, you see the inferior vena cava. That's going to pump deoxygenated blood from the lower half and the trunk of the body into that right atrium. So there's going to be little openings where this blood's going to come in. The right atrium is that receiving chamber. It's going to contract. It's going to push the blood through this valve here, which is going to be called the tricuspid valve. Once it pushes it through that valve, it's then going to enter into the right ventricle. The ventricle contracts and it's going to push it up this way. It's going to go through the pulmonary valve and come into the pulmonary trunk. It's going to split off and go towards the lungs. If it splits and goes one way, that's going to go to the left lung. If it splits and goes the other way, it's kind of behind that superior vena cava, it's going to go to the right lung. Now these are going to be called your pulmonary arteries. Most of the time you think of arteries as carrying oxygenated blood, and it does in the systemic system. But if it's in the pulmonary system, it's carrying deoxygenated blood because the term artery is simply going to be a vessel that's coming off of the heart or carrying blood away from the heart. So it goes to the lungs and it's going to pick up oxygen and it's going to diffuse its carbon dioxide across the alveoli and then you'll exhale it. So as it picks up the oxygen, it's going to make its way back to the heart and it's going to make its way back to the heart through pulmonary veins. So the oxygenated blood is going to come in to the right atrium here it's going to contract, it's going to be pushed through this mitral valve, or sometimes referred to as the bicuspid valve, goes into the left ventricle, and from the left ventricle, it's going to come up through this area into the aorta. Now, the valve that you can't see that's covered behind this section here is going to be the aortic valve. So it goes through the aortic valve, it closes behind it, and then it's going to go in through the aorta. Now, you see it could wrap itself around and go down and dive deep, and you can kind of see it through here, and you can see it coming through here. So as it's diving deep, 
it's going to be feeding the thoracic cavity and all the organs that are going to be in your abdominal pelvic area. And then it's going to split off and it's going to feed the lower limbs. The three vessels that you see on the top are going to feed the neck and the upper limbs. Oops. And here's simply another view showing you the circulatory system. So you have the pulmonary system, which is going to go to the lungs, and you have the systemic system, which is going to carry it to all the systems in the body. So they're starting you out with number one there in the right atrium. You're going through that tricuspid valve into number two, which is going to be the right ventricle. It contracts, gets pushed through the pulmonary valve into number three, which is going to be the pulmonary trunk. It splits off there through the pulmonary arteries and makes its way to the right and left lung. It's going to drop off carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen at those pulmonary capillaries, so that's number four. It's going to make its way back to the heart through the pulmonary veins, and it's going to arrive at the left atrium, that's number five. The left atrium is going to contract. It's then going to get pushed through that valve that separates the atrium from the ventricle. And depending on what you want to use, it could be called the bicuspid valve or it could be called the mitral valve. It's the same thing. Number six is going to be that left ventricle. It contracts. It gets pushed through the valve you see there, which is known as the aortic valve, into the aorta, which is going to be number seven. The aorta then is going to split apart. It's going to take some of it to the upper part of the body, so the head and the arms at number eight or it could take it to the lower portion of the body, which is going to be the trunk and the legs, and that's going to be the lower number eight. So heart sounds are going to be created by the closing of these heart valves that we looked at. And it's also often referred to as a lup dup sound. So the lup part is going to be the atrioventricular valves that slam shut, and that's going to prevent blood from flowing back into the atrium. The dup sound is going to be the semilunar valves that slam shut, and that's going to prevent blood from flowing back into the ventricles. And so that's going to be the pulmonary valve and that aortic valve shutting. When we're talking about the atrioventriculars, that's going to be the tricuspid and bicuspid, or you could say it's the tricuspid and mitral valve. So the flow of blood can be directed towards or away from a specific region of the body. And so how it can do this is what I was talking about. It has um, muscles that are going to be circular muscles that are wrapped around at the capillary section. And so if it wants to direct flow away from that, it simply tightens that precapillary sphincter, which is going to be a smooth muscle that the nervous system controls. It's not going to be under voluntary control. And when it contracts it, it's going to keep that blood from flowing in. Now, if it opens up and releases it, it allows the blood to flow through those capillaries freely. Also, you have what's referred to as muscle contractions that are going to work on the valves of veins. And so that's when the muscle contracts, it's going to force the blood up through the vein. It'll open that top valve, but then it's going to close the bottom valve. And so that blood can't flow backwards. The heart is going to have its own internal pacemaker. That's going to be referred to the, as the SA node. And in that, it's going to be what causes the contraction of the heart. So that electrical signal is going to come from the nervous system. And it's actually that nerve impulse or that action potential is going to start there. And then it's going to go like a wave across the heart. So the wave of electricity is going to follow the same pattern with every single beat. So that SA node and it's going to start there and go across the atrium. So you see the SA, which by the way stands for sinoatrial node. It's going to fire and that contraction is then going to spread across both atria as you see in picture number one. So in an EKG, that is going to be the first reading that you see. Next, it's going to go to number two. That's where that wave of contraction is going to pass down the center of the heart. That's going to be that septum part. And then it's going to bounce back up the, and go out towards the ventricles. And that's going to cause those ventricles to contract. And you see that's going to be that second wave that you see, the QRS wave. 
Now with that, it's going to go down that center, those fibers, and they're called Purkinje's fibers. And then as it goes up, it causes that contraction. Next, those ventricles are going to relax, and that's going to be the last part of the EKG or the wave that you see. There's going to be two major components of blood. One major component or the most or the most amount is going to be the water component. The other is going to be the red blood cells. Other things it's going to actually take in or carry is going to be the respiratory gases. It's going to have some vitamins and minerals. You'll find nutrients. You'll find hormones. You'll find immune cells and you'll find metabolic waste there. So with it, if you took a sample of blood, it looks like a homogeneous mixture, but it is not. If you take it and you centrifuge it, which is what you see in that top picture, they're simply using gravity as they spin it around really fast to separate these materials. So when you separate it, it's actually going to make up three layers. Here you're only seeing two. So the top layer is going to be made up of what we know as plasma. Plasma is going to be a salty type water material. Generally, it's going to be about 90% of the plasma is going to be water. And then it's going to have a variety of molecules, including like metabolic waste, um, metabolites, salts, ions, and hundreds of plasma proteins. Now, you can give plasma or you can go to pl plasma donation centers and actually sell plasma. Um, and they put the red blood cells back in you. And so that you can replace usually within a week or so. The next part is going to be what's referred to as the packed cells. So this is going to be the red blood cells. That's going to be generally more than 90% of those packed cells. 1% of the white blood cells and platelets actually isn't going to really be mixed in with that. It's going to kind of be between that yellow and white layer. And they're going to refer to it, or yellow and red layer. And they're going to refer to it as a buffy layer because it appears to be slightly white. And so that's where you're going to find those white blood cells and platelets. <clears throat> now, all of these formed elements, formed elements means the types of cells and cell parts, are going to be referred to as your hematocrit. So with the types of blood cells, the most that you're going to have is going to be your red blood cells. And we often abbreviate that with RBCs. So if you see RBC, that means red blood cell. White blood cells are going to be fewer and far between. So for every thousand red blood cells, you're going to have one white blood cell. So it's going to be a thousand to one ratio. Now with the red blood cells, if you look at it, they're going to be biconcave discs. These biconcave discs start out as hemocytoblasts. That's going to be how all of the blood cells start out, even the white blood cells. When they start to differentiate and become red blood cells, they are going to change over. They start out with a nucleus, but then they eject that nucleus as they mature and become what's known as a reticulocyte. Once they eject the nucleus and it matures further, it then becomes a matured erythrocyte or red blood cell. It's going to be flexible since it does not have this nucleus in the center and it's going to be very thin. It's going to allow it to make its way through very tight spaces like with the capillaries. And it's going to be packed full of hemoglobin. That hemoglobin is going to be responsible for latching on to oxygen. So what is anemia? Well, anemia is going to be when you have several conditions that could occur. You could have the problem of not having enough iron. You might have too few red blood cells, or you might have some misshapen or misformed red blood cells. And because of that, it's not going to carry oxygen the way that you need it to. Other types of blood cells are going to be um, platelets that you'll find within the blood. So they're going to start out as a hemocytoblast as well. Then they go into a megakaryocyte and then they start to break down into cellular pieces and that's going to help with blood clotting. So along with that, you're going to have the white blood cells. White blood cells also start out as hemocytoblasts. That hemocytoblast is going to be the stem cell of all blood cells. Then it's going to differentiate into specific types. And we refer to all of them as white blood cells, but they could actually be differentiated even more. We have things called neutrophils, 
um, natural killer cells, basophils, eosinophils, monocytes. And so we have all different types. And their job is going to be to destroy pathogens and foreign organisms in the bloodstream and in the interstitial fluids. <coughs> Now, depending on what type you have, depends on what it goes after, what it destroys, and how it destroys it. And so they can tell by looking at what type you might have elevated within your blood, and they'll be able to tell what type of infection you have, whether it's bacteria, parasitic, whether it's a virus, or whether it's some type of inflammation. <laughs> now, the platelets we just talked about, those are going to be broken down megakaryocytes. With those, when it's time for them to go into action, there's usually some type of ruptured blood cell within the body, not blood cell, blood vessel within the body. And so you're going to have fibrin threads that are created through a protein called fibrinogen. These fibrin threads are going to be very sticky, and it's going to cause the platelets to stick to it, along with some red blood cells and some white blood cells. This is going to create what's known as a platelet plug, and kind of like a band-aid that's going to seal up that vessel until it can be completely healed. So if platelets lack properly functioning clotting factors, cuts and scrapes can lead to uncontrolled bleeding. And so this is going to be known as hemophilia. Blood pressure is going to be measuring the strain on the walls of the arteries when the ventricles are contracting. And so that's gonna be referred to as your systolic pressure. When those ventricles are relaxed, that's referred to as the diastolic pressure. So systole and diastole are often what we call them. And so if you're talking about the systolic pressure, you can look over at the meter, that's gonna be the first um, one that's read, the first reading, that's in purple. And so that's basically the force we said that the blood exerts on the artery walls when the heart contracts. Normally, here it says 90 to 140 is going to be the average, but they've kind of changed that. They like it to be around um, 120. If you get into like 130, 135, now they're calling it um, like that's your pre-high blood pressure. That's when you're starting to get into that danger zone and they're going to start watching it. Now with the diastolic pressure or the diastole, that's gonna be the blood or the force that that blood exerts on the artery walls when the heart's gonna be relaxed. That normal range is between here, it shows 60 to 90, but actually now it's they've lowered it to 80 and they call it pre-high blood pressure if it's around 85. That's when they start watching it and they don't like to see it hit 85, let alone 90. 90 now is gonna be your high blood pressure. So they have changed things slightly within the past couple of years. And so when you read blood pressure, here's an automatic or digital blood pressure machine. And so this is going to show you the top number, which is gonna be your systolic pressure, the bottom number, which is gonna be your diastolic pressure. And then below that shows you hypertension or high blood pressure. So if you are pre-hypertension, they are showing you the 120 to 139 for the systolic and the diastolic pressure at 80 to 89. Stage one hypertension, and then you see your stage two hypertension. So they don't want it to be above 120 over 80. Now blood pressure can be measured in four steps. So first you're gonna fasten that blood pressure cuff around the upper arm that's going to clamp off the arteries. Then it is slowly going to release the pressure off of the cuff. The blood is then going to go pulsing through that restricted artery so it can be hard or heard, sorry, with the stethoscope. And then you're going to take the first sound that you hear when you look at the um, reading. That is going to be your systolic pressure. Additional pressure is going to be released so it can make kind of a squirting sound as you're releasing it off of the pump. And then the last sound that you hear is going to be your diastolic pressure. And so you will record that one. So hypertension is going to be one of the main killers. It comes from stress. It basically stretches the vessels over time. Along with that, usually you have high cholesterol and that cholesterol will start to build up and increase that blood pressure even more. And that can be one of the causes for the high blood pressure to begin with. 
um, this is going to actually make vessels kind of stiff. It's going to um, cause different parts of the body to become oxygen starved or to start deteriorating those tissues. One thing that people tend to see a lot if they have high blood, sugar, high blood pressure for extended periods of time is that their vision might actually get a little bit worse. So hypotension is going to be the actual opposite of that. That's going to be low blood pressure, and that's considered anything 90 over 60 or lower. And so basically with that, it's getting inadequate blood flow to the brain. So with larger animals, if you're going to be pumping blood in further distances, you're going to have to go against gravity. So therefore, you're going to have to have more pressure. And so things like giraffes are going to have to have a heart that's going to be able to pump more than twice as great as ours. All right, so looking here, heart attacks are going to result from the narrowing of the coronary arteries that obstruct blood flow to the heart muscle. And so looking here, we see cardiovascular disease. You see how the artery has become narrowed because you have a buildup of cholesterol and plaques that are going to be found there. Now you have two different types of things that can happen. You have arthrosclerosis where cholesterol circulating in the bloodstream is going to form that fatty plaque and it's going to reduce the blood flow. Then you can have arteriosclerosis and that's going to be a buildup of calcium deposits in the plaque and that's going to cause it to harden. So arthrosclerosis is going to be the fatty buildup there that's going to narrow the artery. Arteriosclerosis is going to harden the artery. So one is narrowing the top one and the arterio is going to be the hardening. You need to know the difference between the two. So when you have a heart attack, what happens there is it's going to be caused when there's an interruption of blood flow to certain parts of the heart. Basically, that interruption is going to start starving those tissues of vital nutrients such as oxygen that it needs. Now, when it goes without oxygen, it does cause those tissues to start to die out. And if they die out, they are replaced with fibroblasts which end up being cells that are basically scar tissue. They do not perform their job or function that the rest of the heart muscle will do. All right, cardiovascular disease and plaques. So if you have fatty deposits or plaques on the inner walls of the arteries, that's gonna increase the risk of blood clots as well. And we just talked about arthros, I'm uh, sorry, atherosclerosis, which is gonna be the narrowing and arteriosclerosis, which is gonna be the hardening. So initially the plaques are usually going to be a consequence of cholesterol in the bloodstream. So that's why they tell you to watch your cholesterol, try not to eat too many animal products. And so reducing cholesterol can help you reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, the different types of cholesterols that you take in mainly from um, animal products are going to be the ones that build up in your arteries. The cholesterol that you make in your body is usually going to be what's referred to as the good cholesterol, and it's going to help clean this out of the arteries. So we have what's referred to as HDL and LDL. So the LDL is referred to as the bad cholesterol. This is coming usually from animal products. So with the bad cholesterol, it tends to adhere to the artery walls where it can initiate the buildup of dangerous plaques. If it's good cholesterol, that's the high density cholesterol. And basically that's gonna be what tends to remove the cholesterol from your arteries and delivers it to the cells where it can be broken down and used for other things. Now the American Heart Association is gonna suggest you focus on the ABCs. A, avoid tobacco. Cigarette smokers are gonna be two to three times more likely to die from heart disease. B is gonna be be more active we need to engage in at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity at least five times a week or five days a week and perform muscle strengthening exercises at least twice a week, so toning. And C, choose good nutrition. You need to maintain a healthy body weight, eat fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and limit your saturated fats, trans fats, and alcohols. The lymphatic system is also going to function in with the circulatory system, so it's going to be a complement to the cardiovascular system there. 
The function of the lymphatic system is to help recycle. So it's going to go through. It's going to take the fluid and the proteins that are going to be diffused from the blood capillaries, and it's going to put it back into circulation. It's going to help fight illness and clean out anything like viruses and bacteria and different type of microbes because we're going to find lots of white blood cells packed in those lymph nodes. So they're going to filter and remove. Also, they can remove um, different types of cancers. And they're going to retrieve nutrients. So they're going to have little projections that are going to extend into the small intestine and help absorb some of those fats and lipids in the digestive tract. And they're going to take them to the bloodstream. Lymphatic system failures can result in extreme fluid buildup. And so what you see, like with elephantitis down here, that's where it's not able to filter and clean the um, lymphatic tissue out of the area. So they end up with edema, which is going to be swelling of that area. Polygraph tests are going to use the cardiovascular system in order to tell if you are nervous or in order to tell if you're telling the truth or not. And so with these, they can tell if you're under stress. And usually stress means you're lying. So they take the chest and abdominal movement during respiration and that induce the rate of breathing. They're going to pick up on changes of skin conduction. So if you become more sweaty or you tend to be expressing more um, sweat out of your pores and heart rate amplitude and blood pressure if they go up. So it can be an effective tool for evaluating whether or not the individual is telling the truth. The respiratory system is going to enable gas exchange in animals. And so with gas exchange, it's going to be um, with large multicellular organisms. It's not going to just diffuse across the skin or come in easily. Actually, we're going to use a two stage process. So the respiratory gases are going to be exchanged between the external environment and the organism circulatory system. So with us, it's going to be the capillaries that are going to be in the lungs, specifically the capillaries that are going to be in the small air sacs called the alveoli. And so there, it's going to help with the oxygen diffusing in, and it's going to allow the carbon dioxide to diffuse out. Next, the oxygenated blood is going to be carried to the tissues. There, the respiratory gases or the oxygen is going to diffuse into the tissue that needs it, and the carbon dioxide is going to diffuse into the bloodstream, and then it goes back to the lungs again. So with methods of gas exchange, it depends on what type of animal you're talking about. So if you're talking about simple animals, you're going to have direct diffusion. That's gas exchange that just occurs directly between the cells and its external environment. And this is going to happen usually in things that are going to be single-celled organisms or very, very small organisms. Protruding respiratory sacs are going to be sacs that you find in animals they're going to have like balloon sacs. They're going to increase surface area for gas exchange. And we can see this in things like sea stars and other echinoderms with low metabolic demands. So they're going to be able to bring in the oxygen from the water and release the carbon dioxide out through these um, balloon like sacs that you're going to see. Another type is going to be gas exchange in gills. So elaborate extensions of the body that exchange significant amount of gases in dissolved water. That's where it's going to bring it in. And it's going to occur in things like fishes and marine invertebrates, such as lobsters and clams. So you see the increased surface area there on the gills. Oxygen is going to be able to diffuse in from the water and separate from the hydrogens. And then carbon dioxide is going to diffuse across the gills and exit into the water. Then we move on to animals or organisms such as we see here with the grasshopper. These are going to be mainly in terrestrial insects. They're going to have a network of branching tubes that connect to tiny openings in the body called spiracles. And so they're going to allow oxygen to diffuse in and then the carbon dioxide to come out. Then we have the development of lung structures. This is going to be an internal, internal organ with highly branched, moist surfaces. And so this is going to occur in most land vertebrates. 
<clears throat> so here you're going to see with the lungs, you're going to have those bubbly sacs, which are the alveoli sacs, and that's going to allow that oxygen to diffuse into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide to diffuse out at the capillary. So in summary, in a single-celled and very small multicellular organism, gas exchange can occur by direct diffusion. In large multicellular organisms, though, it can occur in a two-stage process. So oxygen is going to be transported while bound to hemoglobin. And so what's going to happen is you see that hemoglobin molecule there, which is basically going to be four proteins that are hooked together or those polypeptide chains. And when they're hooked together, that iron is going to be able to latch on to the oxygen. So each molecule of hemoglobin is going to be kind of tangled up into four polypeptide chains, and it's going to have four molecules of iron that create four sets, which the oxygen can then attach to. So each red blood cell is going to be packed with about 250 million hemoglobin molecules. And so each one of those can attach to an oxygen. Next, in order to get the oxygen in and the carbon dioxide out, you're, we're going to rely on what's known as partial pressure of oxygen, or PO2, and that's going to affect the binding of the oxygen to the hemoglobin. So if it's a high partial pressure of oxygen, it's going to bind, and so when it encounters this partial pressure, it's going to happen like when you inhale air into the lungs, it's going to get packed with those oxygen molecules, and then it's going to go through the capillaries, into the venules and back to the heart. <clears throat> if it's a low partial pressure of oxygen, that's when the hemoglobin is going to release the oxygen. So once it makes it to a muscle that needs the oxygen, it's going to release that oxygen there and it's going to pick up carbon dioxide, which is going to be carried through the blood plasma. So hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen can, if you have oxygen delivered during a normal metabolic state, then the saturation is going to be high. Usually it's at 100%. Hemoglobin is going to give up only one oxygen molecule in the body tissue before returning to the lungs. But oxygen delivered during high physical exertion is going to have the hemoglobin dip its reserves and is going to release two to three and sometimes even all four of those oxygens. So even though we call it deoxygenated blood when it's heading back to the heart, it still has oxygen concentration in it. It never usually goes below kind of a 30% of oxygen. It's still carrying those. But if you're just sitting here listening to these notes, taking notes, it's only probably releasing one at a time as it goes to the tissues. But if you have been exercising and jogging or moving around, it's releasing two, three, even four. So how does a fetus get oxygen? Well, the mother and fetus do not share a blood supply. It's going to be separate circulatory systems, but they do come close together in that placenta. However, the fetus produces a hemoglobin that's able to bind to oxygen that's released by the mother's hemoglobin. And so that fetus's hemoglobin is going to have a much higher, what they call an affinity for oxygen. Basically, it's able to latch onto that oxygen a lot stronger and take it out of the mother's blood. So first step, deoxygenated fetal blood flows in close proximity of the mother's blood. The fetal hemoglobin, which is slightly stickier or has a higher affinity, is going to latch onto the hemoglobin or oxygen from the mother's hemoglobin. And then... Three, the oxygenated fetal blood is going to flow back to the fetus and deliver oxygen to that fetus. A mutation in the gene for building hemoglobin results in a genetic disorder known as sickle cell anemia. Hemoglobin molecules there are going to be misshapen and they kind of look like a sickle shape and so it causes them to stick together. They are not able to carry oxygen very well, and they can clump together and block vessels. They're going to be very stiff, and they're not going to be flexible like the biconcave discs. So they're not going to be able to make their way through the capillaries or arterioles and venules very well. The hemoglobin also is going to bind to carbon monoxide at a higher rate than it binds to oxygen. And so that CO or carbon monoxide, when it binds tightly, is going to result in the tissues being suffocated. Now looking at the fish to get maximized gas exchange, 
it's going to have what's referred to as a countercurrent method. And so here in the fishes, this complex structure is going to be adapted to extract oxygen from water that generally consists of a four gill structure on either side of its head. And so here you see that gill arch that's going to come out. It's going to be a cartilaginous structure that provides support for those filaments. The filaments are going to be thread-like structures that are going to be composed of hundreds of lamellae, and they're going to spread out and create as much surface area as possible. So doing this, you can look at the next picture that's going to be a lot bigger. You'll see that those lamellae are made of disc-like structures that are going to be stacked along the filaments that contain the capillaries where gas exchange is going to take place. And so basically it increases the surface area so it can get the most oxygen in and the most carbon dioxide out. Respiratory systems of terrestrial vertebrates are going to move oxygen rich air into and carbon, carbon dioxide rich air out of the lungs. So if it's terrestrial vertebrate, the air is going to enter in through the nose and mouth, collect in the pharynx, which we call the throat, pass through the trachea, which we call the airway, into the bronchi or bronchioles that are going to branch into the lungs. Then it's going to pass into smaller bronchioles, which end up in alveoli, which is where the oxygen is going to enter into the blood vessels. So the actual oxygen exchange takes place in the alveoli. And so this is a better look at it. You see the bronchial enters into all these little air bubble looking structures, the alveoli, and that's where the oxygen is actually going to exchange. So how does smoking damage the lungs? Well, it's going to introduce chemicals into the respiratory system that can have destructive effects on cells. So with these, the chemicals can kill immune system cells. They can trigger mucus secretions that block airways. They can cause um, chronic exposure, which will cause those walls of the alveoli to become very brittle. The cilia that's going to be in there on the cells lining the trachea can become very damaged, and they're not going to be able to clean the air as you breathe it in. That way, more microorganisms are going to make it into the lungs and could lead to respiratory infections. Also, the chemicals in the tobacco can trigger unrestrained cell division, which will end up in cancer. So effects on smoking aren't just going to be found in the respiratory tract. You can actually look at people. Here's two twins. One's a smoker, one is not. And so those toxic particles can actually damage your skin and make you look, to, look older. And in women, it can actually cause a rise in testosterone. It could cause the voice to deepen and even hair to start growing on the face. So birds have usually efficient rest unusually efficient respiratory systems. So that's going to be very important because they're going to fly at high altitudes where air is going to be thinner. When the air is thinner, it is harder to latch onto the oxygen and actually get that usable oxygen. So they have high altitude, low oxygen habitats, and they're able to fly for long periods of time because they have an ability to latch onto the oxygen in that thinner air. So what's happening here? Well, exchange gas when the pressure is low, the birds are going to have one-way flow through the lungs via the incorporation of a pair of sacs that you see there. So it's going to come in through the nostrils or mouth, down the trachea, into the lungs, and that's going to have what's referred to as posterior sacs. So during inhalation, that fresh oxygen, like we said, comes in and is going to wait in a waiting room in that sac. At the same time, oxygen poor air is going to be expelled from the lungs and is going to inflate the other sacs, the anterior sacs. And so exhalation, that posterior sac is going to deflate, it's going to push that oxygen rich air into the lungs, and then the anterior sacs are going to deflate and push it out the trachea. All right, ventilation and moving air in and out. And so this is going to be in animals such as ourselves or mammals. So looking here, inhalation is going to require the active contraction of muscles to lift the ribs. And so the diaphragm and intercostal muscles are going to contract. That diaphragm is going to be pulled lower and the rib cage is going to expand. So that diaphragm comes down. That's going to help suck the air in. When we exhale, 
That is going to be when the diaphragm and intercostal muscles are going to relax. The chest cavity is going to return to its normal size, so it's no longer made larger. It's going to constrict or contract. And then the diaphragm that was pulled low is now going to come up. And then air is going to be forced out of the trachea and out of the mouth or nose. Okay. Animals living at high elevations are going to have special adaptations to low oxygen conditions. Remember, air at higher elevations is going to be very thin. And so it's not going to be able to latch on. The blood won't be able to latch on to that oxygen unless they have special hemoglobin. And so that hemoglobin is going to be more or less sticky under the low pressure. And so they're going to have to be at the high elevation. They have low oxygen environments, so they need that stickier hemoglobin, kind of like the fetal hemoglobin, in order to capture that oxygen. There are constraints that are put on oxygen diffusion rates as you go higher as an organism because humans, for the most part, are not meant to be at very high altitudes. Those people who often train at high altitudes or who live at high altitudes are going to have this stickier hemoglobin. Or basically their bones are going to make more red blood cells in order to capture more oxygen. Now, people tend to blood dope which means that they will put more, they take their blood out and then they'll put it back into their system before an event such as a marathon or a boxing or fighting event, or it could be swimming or cycling. They do this so they have more red blood cells, but you can train at a higher altitude in order to get the more red blood cells in order to do this to carry more oxygen. But if you're not used to this, you could become very lightheaded and even faint and pass out if you're not used to or prepared to be at these high altitudes for long periods of time. So over time, you can become acclimated to these low oxygen conditions. Like we said, it will help you create more red blood cells in the red bone marrow, which is going to help carry more oxygen within the blood. But you have to be careful with this because the more red blood cells, the thicker the blood's going to be or more viscous, and you have a higher chance of getting blood clots and having a stroke. Right. So with the acclimation, you can produce a um, DPG in your red blood cells that will help reduce hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, and that helps it release at higher levels when muscles are being exerted. And so that's something that your body can become acclimated to as well. So that's gonna finish our unit six up for circulation and respiration.